There we go. Well, thank you all for joining us. This is um, a really good opportunity for us to gather a little bit and talk about where we're going to be going from here. This has been quite a season these past two years. We had very much hoped that things would return to what we think is normal uh, in the fall. Of course, they haven't. To those of you who are joining us from a distance, because either um, you need to for your own health or some are recovering from COVID, our prayers are with you, and we certainly understand. And we look forward to a day when we can all be together uh, again. There's a new normal now, and at this point, I think we're adjusting to it. We know that whatever normal was two years ago is probably not quite going to be there again. Uh, so how do we begin to step forward, but how do we also um, take a moment to be really intentional about where we build and where we go? So we're going to be talking about a strategic vision, and I was careful to use the word strategic vision rather than strategic plan, uh, because a plan is something to me that, uh, in the worst case, it kind of goes into a binder and you never hear from it again. Um, but it also, um, I think I'd rather lay out a vision that is still being formed and can only be formed with the whole community stepping in uh, and lending not only our voice, but our actions over time. And frankly, we don't know what the near, the near future holds. Uh, pandemics last, the, the impacts of pandemics last not months or years, but frankly decades. Uh, but to say nothing of the fact that we're still in an acute moment of it, uh, and we don't quite know where things are gonna go. That being said, this is a really important moment for us to take stock of where we are and where it might, we might be going. So over the last, um, eight, uh, over the last nine to 12 months, we've been doing some of this work in what has been a quiet moment in Trinity's life because there's a limit on how much in-person work we can be doing, activity that we can be doing. It gave us a moment to listen a little bit more carefully. And a lot of this, I'll share with you where a lot of this information is coming from. And then a lot of the discernment and mapping work uh, came from Adrian. Uh, and me really sharing what we've learned and what we're hearing, reflecting that with our vestry and our cathedral council, uh, and then coming to you today. So it first starts by listening to the past, both distant and recent. So listening to the past, listening to two, three, four years ago, listening to 10 years ago, because we are a cathedral listening to 100 years ago, 115 years ago, 200 years ago. We've been around for a little while. And that's an important part of this conversation. Listening to some of the things, uh, good and bad, that surfaced during the years of transition uh, and, and both interim between deans and then you're still in a season of inter transition as you're coming in. And then really the pandemic hit before we had a chance to really start building. And I think we've named before that a lot of this kind of important interim work uh, didn't happen as much as we'd like it to. And while you can't totally repeat it, this has given us a moment to ask some of those questions uh, with a little bit more trust built up amongst all of us uh, to go forward from there. So we're going to be looking forward considering, one, what our, what our cathedral hopes, dreams, and goals are. And remember, this, for me, this is a vision. This is a, these are moving targets. And I'm really just sharing where we are and inviting everyone more fur further into the conversation. Considering... Who, what we say, and how we communicate it. Communication is so important in our world today. Uh, it's true in churches and certainly of a church of our size and complexity. How we communicate is vitally important in what we're saying. You know, what is our voice, uh, both in our community and how we speak among ourselves? What is, what is our staff structure? How are we built, built to carry out our mission? That necessarily changes not only over time, every five or 10 years, but also when we go through leadership transitions. So some pieces of structures that we had previously serve us well, and some not so much, not as, not as much as they did. I'm not gonna be talking about staff structure today, uh, but I'm giving you a picture of, of what some of our next steps might be. And of course, the same thing can be asked of how do we, how do we together carry out the ministry of the church, the ministry of the cathedral. What is working for us? What has worked really well in previous seasons? And how might a new vision uh, call for some new ideas um, as well? 
So these are there are some core, core some questions that we have that really guide this conversation. So rather, oh, I'll give it away. I already said what it was. Um, rather than starting with the question of what do we want to do, or who are we, rather, or what's our favorite liturgical style, or what is our favorite type of sermon, or what what what's our favorite uh, vestment, or whatever. The deeper question is far more important, which is what are our core values? Uh, so spend some time really listening carefully uh, in terms of what we say, what we do, what we act. And, and sometimes these are things that are kind of, there's a lot of words that we throw out that are kind of readily available. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then some things are just what I see by living with you all for three years. Um, one thing I, I do have to share besides a word of thanks, uh, in the last few months have been a very difficult time for my family. Uh, what I received from Trinity was an incredible gift. Uh, so many wonderful statements of support, really rich uh, notes that you all have sent me. Uh, and each one told such a story, I would say, of faithfulness uh, that very much helped to carry me through a difficult time but also taught me something really beautiful about you all. And I hear that, and I, you'll hear about faithfulness in just a moment. But that's one of the ways, where does this discernment happen? It comes from living together and realizing, you know, seeing and hearing some really important things. Um, some key questions are strategic areas of focus. What do we want to do? What do we want to do better? What, what do we like doing but we put a lot of energy into it and it's just not catching uh, um, momentum. So where do we also name some things that aren't where we're gonna focus so that we can really put our energy behind what is most important to us. So gathering information and feedback, how did we listen and what did we hear? Um, first of all, I think data is actually pretty important and helpful. There's not a whole lot of reams of data that a church produces. That's not the most important thing. But I did look at some historical data. And in particular, I looked at attendance from 1990 to 2020. Now, I realize that Sunday attendance is not the only way that we measure congregational vitality. And especially in a cathedral and in the changing world, there are many ways that we are uh, active in the life of the community and a vibrant church. However, ASA continues to be the best metric for knowing what's really going on uh, in, in our church. We tend to, we are, we are encouraged to, for example, build staff around what our, our Sunday participation is. It is also, quite frankly, the single uh, best source of accountability to where we can say to one another, this is what's this is where we're seeing things grow and thrive. This is where things are changing. And it's not good or bad uh, to go up or down. It just is what it is. And then, we, oh my gosh, I think that's a big phrase in the city. I don't, um, yeah, yeah, I don't mean to go there. Um, but rather, look, name it, see it, and ask what do we need to learn from it? And, and to do this, I took those big red dusty books where we write down, you know, what happened on the given Sunday, and we'll do it this Sunday as we do it for every Sunday. And I went through every single Sunday for the past 30 years. That actually includes Saturday nights as well, as long as it's not a wedding. Um, no, it was actually really uh, rich. I, I started by saying, I'm going to create a format, and then I'm going to ask Ginger to do it. But I realized, yeah, um, <laughs> Then I realized that I wanted to kind of walk through every Sunday, right? Kind of like instead of having a labyrinth that you walk, you sort of walk through the thing on your desk. And it was really beautiful to go through and see every single thing that we did in 95, in 2004, in 2012. And every time uh, I saw everybody that signed their name, I saw, I saw Ed Met signing their name and Will Mevin and Tracy Lind and all of these things. And I got to kind of walk through with you uh, all the different kind of waves of the last 30 years. Uh, and it also, and while I was doing, I was kind of noting, so right, keeping track so that we could then kind of chart out and see what that looks like. So historical data is helpful and it often 
tells us a story we didn't expect. This has been true in every church where I've been, where we say, well, uh, in my last church, we said, you know, we, we've been a little bit, it's been a little while since we had three services. We've kind of been not thriving, and it's been about 10 years. I looked at the book, it had been 40 years. Isn't it funny how churches do that, right? So it helps to actually see them. Um, I do a lot, we've been doing a lot of skills building exercises in vestry and cathedral council, and that gives me a chance not only to teach, but also to listen. Last spring, we did the question of the week where we asked things like, what's your favorite hymn? What, what Christian troublemaker is most meaningful to you? What, what source of art outside our tradition and within our tradition is most meaningful to you? Uh, our community conversations last, um, when where they fall, were really, really productive and helpful and rich. And I thank everyone who participated in that. And then of course, one-on-one -on -one conversations. So, there we go. So this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the, the Sunday services in the cathedral to look at what the pattern over the last 30 years has been. Um, and and I, you may have an expectation of what this is going to look like. I know that I did based on all the things that I heard both before coming here and after getting here. And I'll just share with you what I heard and what I heard sort of reinforced. And that is that we had a very consistent pattern of attendance for at least the last 10 years, and it was a very high number of about 375. And then the interim came and everything kind of plummeted. That's the story that I kind of heard. You all may have a different story in your head. Um, so, but I want to just, just to say, it's always more nuanced than you think. It's always more nuanced than you think. So what we have here, and I'm sorry, I can't, all right, how do I do this? I've got the Zoom people watching. Um, you probably can't read the really tiny numbers down at the bottom, can you? You can, just a little bit. All right, so I'm going to, excuse me, Zoom, I'm going to kind of, this, this is sort of, this is uh, 1990 to 1999. This is 99 to 2010. This is 2010 to 2020. Um, I do not list the pandemic on this because all bets are kind of off once the pandemic hit. We'll, let's get together in 20 years and figure out what this thing meant. But right now, we're, there, we're looking at that data. So for those of you on Zoom, if you, it's a little tight to read. The first third is the uh, 1991 to 2000. You have a little bit of a dip and then a rise up. That was the previous transition interim. Then you have a, 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 a a, a period of growth um, for about the first four or five, six years of that, then a, a plateau. So that's a really good place to be. And then around 2011, um, there was a peak. And then there really was a transition, something that was changing a little bit and, and kind of a gradual decline that when you hit in that later kind of farther drop, that's the interim that happened. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to read this. And I've been sitting with this for a long time. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but you have in that first third, steady church growth, um, which is a, a, a really good thing, to, a wonderful thing to have. Um, you have in that second third, uh, dramatic church growth, also a wonderful thing to have. Yes. Uh, and I, I also think that when we're thinking about a church, church has moved in decades. And so it is important to me. And I, I've also come up. Okay. Uh, okay, can they read this? Can they see this on Zoom? Okay, so I think it's important not only to look at three years, five years ago, but also 30 years ago, because that's a part of our life together too. How do we learn from all of it? How do we learn from all of it? Okay, I'm totally out. Uh, how are we doing? I have 10, 20. Is my clock right? 10, 28, 20, 28. We're doing fine. Okay, so, and we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. So we can, if you want to make a note, we can come back to any of this stuff. So when the vestry met, vestry and cathedral council 
met for a, a shared session during the Vestry Retreat this past October. And at this point, we've been doing some of this work for about six or seven months and wanted to bring into conversation with these leadership bodies uh, thoughts about what these core values are and what, what I've been hearing, what Adrian and I together have been hearing. Uh, but we wanted to start with an exercise, a core values exercise with Vestry and Cathedral Council. Um, probably, the, uh, have we had that kind of shared meeting? We haven't done that much lately, have we? That was at least new in the time that I've been here. It, um, if we, But it was really uh, made for some rich conversation. And simply put, we got two pieces of newsprint out uh, and Audrey was writing on one, who was writing on the other, I can't, and Daryl was writing on the other, and we just said, okay, think about what your core values are when you think of as Trinity, and just throw them out. And so I, we wrote those down, and I'm going to read through all of them um, to see if you don't hear Trinity in all these words, supportive, consistent, gener generosity, honesty, diversity, empathy, compassion, welcoming, Relationship, baptismal covenant, which we did this morning, gratitude, friendship, stewardship, excellence, beauty, music, quality worship, challenge, appreciation, community, discerning, questioning, humor, honesty, flexibility, mercy, tradition, equality, justice, love, fairness, inclusivity, service, communication, leadership, artistic, education, faithfulness, prophetic. Do you all hear yourself in that? Any words you'd throw out that we're missing? Contemporary. Contemporary, okay. Discipleship. Discipleship. Growth. There are so many words that kind of describe who we are. And, you know, we're, we could put all of this on the front page of the website, um, but that would make for a very bad website. So uh, how, do, how do we communicate this succinctly, but in a way that is expansive and invites new interpretation and new engagement? And so this is drawing on these. This is partly we wanted to hear, are, are we hearing what we think we're hearing? And, and to me, the answer is yes, that this, that exercise helped to lift up what I see as some really critical values. Now, for, uh, first of all, core values will go on the website, um, but they aren't what's written on your website. Right? It's not what's written. It's not what I, uh, they are essentially values that are in the DNA and in the walls. And we're looking here for values that not only speak, in, speak comprehensively about where we have been in the last part of our lives together, but values that go back uh, two generations, four generations, seven generations. Now, I will say going back. Before the cathedral was built, that's a little bit harder to find information on that one. Um, we do have some of those books. They are very dry. Um, but generally speaking, much of what we're looking at are core values that were a big part of who we are when this cathedral was built uh, in the generation prior that very much led up to that, but also speak authentically to who we are today and who we have been over these past few generations. And so five core values that we discerned are, are this. One is integrity. Integrity means we are who we say we are. It means we lead integrated lives. Uh, it means our, our, there is a, there's a strain of consistency between who we are at church, who we are in our families, who we are in our workplace. And it means that how we, I, I find a lot of our, our desire for authenticity, and I hear that from all of us, and that sometimes means different things to different people. But it's clearly a part, to be a part of Trinity, I find, means we want to live the Christian faith authentically. And I hear that in our justice work. 
I hear that in our liturgy. I hear that in our compassion. And to me, that's, that's a statement of integrity. Um, dignity. We're doing the baptismal covenant this morning. I heard this over and over again when I got here and long after. We honor and respect the dignity of every human being. That is a critical, critical part of who we are. Um, and I see, we talk a lot about inclusivity, which is essential to Trinity's life. I see inclusivity as being integrity and dignity together producing who we are and how we live in the world. Um, faithfulness, faithfulness. I heard discipleship. Um, I love that. And I see that as a part of faithfulness as well. So yes, in the letters that everyone sent me when our family had gone through a loss, uh, in the fact that we have a uh, leadership that shows up to so many meetings every week, um, that's wonderful, faithful, that people who are here throughout Sunday morning, not just once, but through multiple services, people who are here to, to serve and to lead every Sunday, that's faithfulness. Uh, and it comes not just, a, it's not just public service, it's a sense of who we are as the body of Christ. And I think it's really beautiful. Um, continuity. How do we connect to history? How do we connect to those who are coming after us? How do we connect through continuity to our, our sibling churches here in Cleveland and around the, around the world? Now, I realize very, this is probably a new word. It's not one we throw around much. And I don't expect you to get out of bed to say, I'm going to church because I love some continuity, right? <laughs> that's, that is not what gets you here, and that's okay. But this is why I see it as a core value. And, and we had some vigorous discussions about this in our, in our shared meeting. A cathedral, look at this room. Look at this room. Was this room built last Tuesday? No, look at the cathedral. It's been here for 113, 14 years. Um, and we know, every church wants to be here for a while, but I think we know that we, not only do we have the blessing of worshiping in its midst and being the hands and feet of Christ um, out in the community as members of the cathedral, I think we all know that we have a special responsibility, that we are the keepers of this place. We are the stewards of this place. And we are trying to hold together a place so that it will be here in another 114 years. Uh, and to me, that's, there's a special responsibility, and I would say a gift. We, we're here because we love that work. So that's continuity. But I also see that there is a continuity of voice. I have found, as your dean, that there is a great respect and love for previous deans and a desire to hear, while different voices, to also hear a kind of consistent speaking on behalf and in support of the cathedral. There's continuity there as well. Um, and so I find, that to be, I find that to be a rich gift in our Christian tradition. That as the cathedral, we, we have a special responsibility there, and I see it in our actions. Um, and then transcendence. Okay, ooh, I'll, I'll go back. You don't get out of bed to come to church because you love continuity. I'll bet that, but you probably do because transcendence draws us together. And that means something different to different people. That's why we have different liturgical styles. But there is, there is something, I'll use the word capacious. You'll hear that again later in the presentation. There is something outside of ourselves that we don't get simply in our day-to-day -day lives. Although at our best, we are carrying that sense of transcendence from the cathedral into the community itself. So these are five core values that I have found um, really excite me that within this, uh, I hear the things, the actions that are so important, our inclusiveness, our sense of justice, our sense of beauty, our desire to have a meaningful voice in the world. Uh, I see these things as emerging from these core values. And though we've had different vocabulary words over the years, this is, these are, are, are things that I see very much in our DNA. So going forward, I would, uh, would suggest um, three particular areas of focus. Now, nothing here is likely to shock you. We're, we are not going to close the cathedral and turn it into a pet store. Um, we, <laughs> um, but it, because this is consistent with where we've been and, and who we are. Um, but I do think that every season, 
calls us to carefully take stock of where we are and what we might do to help focus, to really help us to thrive. Um, one is Trinity Commons. Trinity Commons have largely been quiet during the pandemic, and they still are, and, and folks are beginning to, to come back and use that space once again. But something that I think we want to do is refocus our energy in terms of how we use Trinity Commons as an outward focused programmatic space. Now, something that we do is uh, it's a space for community groups to come and gather. Uh, there have been more of that in the past. We'd like to see that continue to return. Um, and I would say years ago, there was more, I'm, I'm guessing, Cynthia, 10 years ago, is that probably a, a roundabout number? So that had been declining a little bit over the years, a number of reasons why that might have been the case. But I also want to propose that we start thinking not just about a space that's available for people to meet. It's always going to be a space for us to gather as our congregational space um, and not a place simply for a, a hall to rent, um, though we, sometimes that rental income is good. Uh, but rather, how do we intentionally program this as an offering to the whole community? Um, not necessarily as a desire to have people come in and be a part of our congregation, uh, but rather, how can we uh, be a beacon at the heart of the community? A great example, how many of y'all were participated in Undesigned Red? That was, that's a lot of hands, and thank you all for doing it. That was a really spectacular example of the kind of things that we'd like, uh, of which we would like to do more. Now, how did that come to be? Well, we had a number, a few staff members um, for whom that was not their primary responsibility, uh, but who did a really wonderful job uh, no learning of this opportunity. And I think the term is wrangling it, bringing it to us uh, and helping us to make it happen. And then we as a whole congregation made it, made it happen. And that was really great, but that's not, if we we're gonna do that kind of thing on a regular basis, it's not really sustainable to just think it's gonna happen in the cracks between staff members taking a break from doing the job we've hired them to do and then go bring in major citywide events. It's a lot to ask. Um, and so we're, we're recognizing that having some dedication within our staff to help make that happen Maybe a strong way to go forward. So that's one. Ooh, I talked all about commons already. Um, Trinity Congregation, we'll talk about that more in a moment. But what I'm doing here is um, drawing some distinction. There's going to be lots of wonderful overlap. But saying, let's be intentional about where we're resourcing our community-focused ministries through the commons. And now let's also be intentional about how we're caring for and nurturing our congregation. I think our congregation is our strongest resource. And as we are strong and faithful, so too will our outward focused ministries be sustainable and strong over time. So I will always come back to that value of making sure that we are as, uh, as healthy a congregation as we can be. And finally, campus engagement. Um, we sometimes forget when we get out of our car in the parking lot and come through the piazza and the promenade in the cathedral, we have our transcendent worship. We go back, we have our transcendent coffee. We get into our transcendent car, we go home, and we never look at the campus of 18,000 students right out of our door. And while we never wanted the pandemic, at least by worshiping across the street, we had a little bit of an image of, of the ecosystem that surrounds us. Uh, and so how can we meaningfully serve them and be more than um, just a nice museum set piece at the corner of 22nd and Euclid? So first, talked a little bit about Trinity Commons. Our goal is to establish Trinity Commons as a place for programming that inspires, nourishes, and celebrates the image of God in all people. That means programming that inspires and transforms. That means relationships that heal the city. A gather, to be a gathering place for the becoming, for the, of the beloved community and a place for embodied service, neighbors serving neighbors. 
we're early in this process. What we're doing through our, our, we've done a lot of staff restructuring work in the last year. And part of that, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks, part of that is to create some capacity uh, within our staff structure to begin to discern some of this and see what, care, what it might look like to carry this out. Um, but the idea is to first name it as something that's important to us. And not only does Trinity, um, forgive me for, I'm going to use the term, have a brand, um, Trinity Commons does as well. As you move around the, the city of Cleveland, people know about Trinity Commons. Um, now, they have different ideas, and it's often because they were in a group that met there at some time. Uh, how can we move into, the, in, into offering more intentional programs? I also think that our, our we, music and art, but I'm gonna use the broader lens to, to uh, simply say Trinity sacred art and music uh, is an expression of Trinity Commons as well as of the cathedral. And that means focusing not only on the wonderful music we're already doing, um, it's, it's no small thing to be on the cover of American Organist magazine, um, so, wonderful work to everybody who helped make, uh, who have brought about the, in, who have helped to install the organ that we have and of course build that program over time. But I think we can add to that. I think we can connect to the city beyond our doors by being a source for sacred art and music. High quality, interdisciplinary, multicultural and m music and performance art that seeks transcendence at the intersection of so many tributaries of creativity. How can we explore many expressions of the sacred from literature to film, from lectures to art installations, from non-traditional choral works to music from all sorts of cultural sources? I think it's a great time now to be naming a vision. Yes, it's gonna take time for everybody to begin to, to move back into our space. We, we can see we're, you know, we're in the midst of Omicron. Even before that, folks are slow to return. Now's a really good time to begin articulating where we might be, what foundations we want to lay. Because though I think people are really hungry for a deeper connection with their city, uh, a deeper connection with the sacred and a deeper connection with one another. So talking about the congregation, we will grow in number and diversity as a hub of formation, community, and service for children, youth, and adults of all ages. We will strengthen our ministries of welcome and connection. Ginger Bittekofer is already starting this work and doing a great job of it. This is this has grown as a pastoral focus in our in our weekly or biweekly conversations. Adrian and Ginger and I meet to talk about who's new and what's going on in the life of our church. We want to re-energize and direct our servant ministries of the cathedral. This also is already happening. Uh, a word of thanks to Be Becky Fuller and Mary Stickbert, who uh, are, did really great work re-engaging our, our relationship with Marion Sterling School. Um, thanks to Adrian for helping to guide that as well. And we want to continue to see those types of partnerships grow. Uh, one path, and this is looking at all the ministries in our life together, is, uh, and this is one path. This is not a decided thing, but part of our conversation is, is to establish working groups uh, that to help us to focus our ministries. We're often spread out over many, many different things. And sometimes that's just fine, uh, but sometimes if we want to really build some momentum, we have to think intentionally about where we want to put our energy behind. We want to expand our education offerings, especially the Trinity Forum. I've, I've heard from you all how much you value that. I enjoy it and I value it. Um, and I think being intentional about how we resource it is an important thing to do today. We want to cultivate and lead a community of formation, belonging, and belovedness for children, youth, and their families. Uh, we named that on the vestry, and, and uh, someone on the vestry um, kind of then shouted out, this is what we want for our whole congregation, which is true, but I wanna read it again in thinking about children and youth. We wanna cultivate a community of formation, belonging, and belovedness. 
Something I have observed is, is yes, there are extra challenges being a downtown cathedral with this kind of work. However, you know what? Everybody travels to get to the church these days. And I have found that in the seasons where we have offered um, stable, uh, nurturing, uh, um, uh, inspired ministry to children and youth, we've actually seen it grow, even in the midst of the pandemic. Yes, we've been through some, some series of transitions, and we're looking to staff that more sustainably, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we have something at the cathedral, which is, frankly, a really rich asset for children and youth. Um, all the things we have to share and teach uh, is something that I, a lot of parents are looking for for children. And when I think of what you, I now have a teenager. Um, your prayers are welcome. Um, <laughs> When I think about what is essential to youth ministry, what do we have at the cathedral? We have this incredible witness. We have all of these. I'm looking at such wonderful people who I want my oldest child, well, my youngest too, but he's still young, um, to get to know and learn about your own faith journey. That's what youth ministry is about. That's, that's about the community raising children together. And, and I can't, this, we have such incredible resources for that in terms of the people and the witness and the voice and the values of Trinity people. And so what we wanna do is structure that and resource it to, to thrive and grow over time. And finally, and this is not new, this is not new, but I think it's important to name as a focus, to celebrate Trinity as a living community of faith, the body of Christ in prayer and action. Who are we? Why do we do what we do? We do it because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And this is the core of our congregational identity. Finally, campus connections. We want to, we are a part of a campus in, uh, um, ecosystem, uh, whether we know it or not. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we can begin to do to really open up those doors to establish Trinity as a place of spirituality and respite for students, a church home for those seeking it, and an integral community partner in the eyes of CSU administration and students. Uh, in all the things I'm gonna list here, um, Adrian Cook has done wonderful work in beginning this and opening up those doors. And I think anything we can do to support her in this uh, will go a long way. One, we have this incredible thing going called Evensong, which the liturgy itself is gorgeous and is an opportunity to invite more in at a moment Wednesday evening uh, of rest. Um, as a student, even song as a student and a campus focus activity. Again, not changing the liturgy, but rather turning the lights down a little bit. Perhaps some of the sermons will be a little less academic and a little bit more seeker oriented. Those are some of the ideas that we're talking about. Um, that's a nice way of me saying, Owens, don't preach so long, please. How do we relation? How do we work on relationship building? How do we uh, have offer shared offense? with various departments and, and student support groups within, the, uh, within uh, CSU? And, and how do we make the commons an available space for them as well? So that's the, our three areas where I think strategic focus will help us. One is Trinity Commons. Two is Trinity Congregation. Uh, and three is campus engagement, CSU and belong beyond. I'm gonna, con I'm gonna conclude with a quote of vision. I'm gonna give you a vision statement from Bishop Leonard. Who can tell me who Bishop Leonard is besides Barbara? <laughs> you, no hands down, Barbara Hermes. Bishop Leonard? He built the cathedral. Uh, he is, uh, you know, he, if, if you want to go down to the columbarium, there is a vault and uh, everybody else, gosh, I'm going to a dark place, aren't I? Um, rather than everybody else, it, it's, a, it's a columbarium. However, in the vault, you have two caskets, which is Bishop Leonard and Bishop Leonard's wife. Um, he very much, it was his vision for, for building this place. Uh, and, and was consistent with a vision for what American cathedrals could be. So this was a new thing in the late 1900s, uh, this idea that why would we rebuild cathedrals in the American landscape? Well, 
what he wrote says to me a lot. See, it, we don't he, see ourselves in this original vision from 115 years ago. The cathedral is the church for the masses of the population. It is intended to offer doors wide enough for the religious ingatherings of many who are even churchless and perhaps creedless. It is capacious in its intention. Best word ever. It is capacious in its intention. Socially, a great civic and moral as well as ecclesiastical church. And there should be a universal consciousness of the truth that its doors are open to everyone especially those who have no particular church home. Such should realize that they may say gladly, this is our church and I have a right to it. This is our church and I have a right to it. And so I want to offer to you a vision for Trinity that is not new at all, but is perhaps something that we recognize, each of us recognize in something that brought us to this place and a phrase that can perhaps invite more people in in the years to come, and that is Trinity Cathedral, a sacred place for all people. Trinity Cathedral, a sacred place for all people. Do you hear yourself in that? I'm gonna start using this language. Can I use this language, is that okay? Good, we're gonna start doing this, but. Um, I want to thank all of you for um, your faithfulness, and, and I'll, I could go down the list of all the core values, uh, but this is a really loving and supportive place, uh, and to be both a, a rich congregation um, of love and discipleship, uh, but one with a deep sense of, its, of its, our stewardship responsibilities, stewardship of a place, but also of a voice. Uh, and these things are also important. So I'm going to take, I've of course gone to maybe not too long because we'll have more time in a few weeks. Uh, but I want to take a moment to invite any thoughts or questions. And uh, Janet, are you able to watch? Janet is also watching our, our online folks. I hope you all in Zoom were able to follow along pretty well. Feel free to, to send notes if, if there were some questions I could answer. But and as you ask questions, I'll do my best to repeat them so we can hear. Alice. Uh, Right. And they were also very balanced and balanced. Yes. Uh, so I think we partner with the diocese with some Absolutely 100%. And so Allison's statement in question was that the diocese was quite instrumental in bringing Undesigned the Red Line to uh, the cathedral. And in fact, that was a partnership that was the cathedral as an expression of uh, 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 of the diocese of Ohio. Um, to to answer that is a very good question. Are we uh, working with the diocese as a part of the Commons? I would also say this whole vision is something that uh, I've shared with Bishop Hollingsworth. Um, he's excited about it. Uh, we also recognize that we have a new bishop coming in the next few years, and that will be part of our conversation. And curiously, the, um, the charter for the commons articulates, and we figured out this after the fact, Dan um, Hout Riley, our controller, who's very good at finding old documents very quickly, uh, found in the, in the charter document describing the relationship between the diocese and the cathedral in the commons is articulating this exact thing. Different language, but saying we together are going to be uh, in partnership leading uh, a community focused program. So absolutely 100%. Debbie and then Janet. Um, so I'm really excited about this and I'm really excited about the fact plans and whatever, and I really do hope that we don't lose some of our cutting edge of a cathedral of worship and space and sacredness. Mm -hmm. But to, as like being a teacher and said to talk, that was some of our being cutting edge. Right. And I pray that we don't lose 
some of that, or you know, diet that's worth it. Is on exactly. Part of the growth part for me personally was learning things that wow, that's sort of cutting edge. Absolutely. So Debbie named the, the, the quote from Bishop Leonard as being cutting edge back in the 1907s, which no doubt it was. And the hope that we don't lose uh, that cutting edge as a part of, of who we are. And I would, uh, my response, I think that's exactly right. And something that came up in the cathedral conversations was a phrase, creative tension. Um, how do we keep in tension both, and I, I mean, tension is a good word. Um, this how do in a dynamic creativity between both um, a broad sense of the tradition of which we speak quite well, but also the capacity to do new things and try new things in ways that hadn't been done before. We are, I think, uniquely positioned that if we don't have that tension, we aren't being creative. So I think we need we we do need that, Janet. Sure. Yes, we will post the PowerPoint uh, online and on social media. Thank you. Marie. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're not the movie really registered with me because I've been thinking a lot about how our lives change over the years for a long time in some ways and other things. This is what it's giving us. So, uh, personally, I think I have to be more, even though uh, the Peter Lloyd kind of plays with this role, uh, how do you know we have to be more patient and uh, people who are uh, trans? I do want to add a little too what, uh, I don't know how to extend it, but what this says, and uh, Barbara Fleming says this too, about pushing forward and being a leading edge or a cutting edge. Um, to think, I'm thinking back to the 60s and mm -hmm. um, civil rights at that time. And I don't see that particularly in some of the language at the moment. So that is kind of how we use innocence, but also that it is perhaps particularly sincerely, I think, successful. Because you grab a creative tension between continuity, tradition, but yet also the leading edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Marie said that she valued the continuity piece because so much changes in our lives that, and, and raise your hand or lower your hand if I'm getting it wrong. Um, so much changes in our lives that the church, and in this case, the cathedral, it is a source of continuity and stability in the midst of so many other things kind of upturn, changing over time. She also named, and going back to the idea of uh, cutting edge, and speaking to our history back in the 60s as our role in the civil rights movement, uh, that that needs to be a part of it and that, uh, that Marie is not yet hearing as much of that language in this and where we've been as, as she'd like to. Bob, and then, okay, we're gonna, Bob, and then Uta, and then, I'm sorry, I don't know you behind the mask. Tony, is that Tony? Okay, sorry. Bob. Okay. Uta. Is it Marie? Oh, I'm sorry, Marie. And then Tony. Tony, you got everybody waving for you. I'm sorry about that. We haven't really gotten into that phase. I would say that 
only one concert happened when I was here. Um, and that was the Ladysmith Black Mombazo concert, which was just fabulous. Um, I think they, in terms of the type of work and what it required of us and what it gained for us, the, the concerts had a bit of a checkered history. Um, and I think we would want to be clear on what types of things um, we want to bring in and what is, what, what, what is worth the amount of energy that we put into in order to do it. So I think, but I think um, it's a great thing to bring up because Ladies from the Black Mombasa is, a, I think, a, I hope a great example of what you're talking about that turned the cathedral space into a joyful sacred concert hall and it was filled with Trinity folks and people beyond that. And it was great, um, uh, a great event for everybody who gathered. So I would say yes, but I would say with greater intention uh, uh, behind it. Janet. Um, Good question. I, th I mean, as we've thought about the comments, um, I mean, we're really early in shaping what that looks like, but given what the last uh, year, year and a half, excuse me, two years have been like, um, we realized that it would have to also have a digital presence. Um, that, that if we're offering programs, chances are we'll need to do something with a, some kind of a, a digital uh, online offering um, because that, especially if we're still in the pandemic. But I would also add that the, the, the digital, um, the live stream have been um, both good for those who cannot be here, difficult because we don't see each other as much, um, but also surprisingly helpful in terms of getting people to meet Trinity Cathedral. So we've met a lot of people in the last four or five months of being back who saw us online and then came in the door. So there's a really great evangelism and opportunity for, for, for uh, spreading the word of who we are through that. Um, I think all of these have to do with kind of careful attention of where we put our focus, our energy, our staff, and our financial resources. Um, so I don't have a firm answer other than it's a good thing to bring up and name that it's there. How we, okay, time, it is, oh, okay, that time to go. One more question from Amy and then, go ahead, Brant. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, so Brant raised the question of, um, while honoring the quote from Bishop Leonard, um, going, relying to, and the continuity is valuable, but if we're relying too much on a uh, quote unquote golden age and going to that, that is not gonna be helpful. And in fact, that was not a golden age for a great many people. And I, I think that needs to be our work. I don't think we have a golden age. Um, and I, you know, th this is sort of, we can go to previous ages and find um, wonderful pieces like this and use them. Uh, and we can also, I, I'm grateful to the Becoming Beloved Community and Adult Formation Group who are looking at the deeper side of our history to find out what voices we're speaking in recent generations who we have, haven't heard as much from. Um, I feel comfortable cherry picking things like this. And I'm sure there are lots of sermons from that time I'm not gonna read. Um, I think that's a really, but if we're gonna name continuity, I'm, I'm grateful for this. And, and then I'm gonna like, run out the door um, after this. 
I'm grateful for that because if we're going to name continuity, which I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that affirmation, we also have to name that there is no golden age. It's our work to be the church today. This is not about nostalgia. It's about drawing the giftedness from different times uh, and moving on from there. So thank you all very much. We'll see you in church.